Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My name is Jahan Zeb Khan, and I say all participants of today's webinar welcome on behalf of University of Engineering and Technology Alumni of Canada, and we also call it UETech. UETech Professional Development Committee has organized a various number of seminars over the past few years. And if you are also interested to share your knowledge, experience, and expertise to help community, you may contact us. Today webinar exciting topic is new materials for resilient infrastructure. This topic is very important in the current state of deteriorated infrastructure problem across the globe. And our respected guest to talk on such an exciting topic is Dr. Professor Shamim A. Sheikh. He is Professor, Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering, University of Toronto. He is professional engineer, researcher, author, and co-author of various research papers, design codes, standards, material specifications, and books. He has been honored by various awards and accolades from Canada, USA, Japan, China, and Pakistan. Government of Pakistan has recently honored Dr. Professor Shami Sheikh with star e Imtiaz. Pakistan. His area of expertise are performance-based seismic design, use of fiber reinforced polymers such as GFRP or CFRP. As Dr. Shamim Sheikh has concerns that Korean of steel problem is costing millions of dollars to the global economy. Effect of climate change on concrete structures and expensive cement and its applications are also his area of expertise. I have kept intro of Dr. Sahib very simple on his own request. However, there is a lot to tell about him and his contributions, his extraordinary contributions to the engineering and society. As I know, he is member and director of various charity non-profit and professional organizations. And above all, he is patron in chief of our own organization, UETAC, University of Engineering and Technology, Alumni of Canada. So we say thank you to Dr. Saab for taking time for today's webinar and welcome. Over to Dr. Saab. <laughs> इंट्रोडक्शन में आप सिर्फ दो फिक्रे बोल दीजिए ताकि जरा टाइम जाया ना हो थैंक यू वेरी मच टू ऑल दोस हु हैव जॉइंड अस आई सॉ दैट देयर आर अबाउट थर्टी पीपल इन द ऑडियंस एंड आई वुड लाइक टू रियली थैंक द एग्जेक्टिव्स ऑफ द यूटेक एग्जेक्टिव कमेटी फॉर गिविंग मी दिस ऑपरचुनिट to organize and i'll tell you the reason behind we usually make these presentations to people who are expert in the field and i know that in this audience there will be some people who would follow it very easily but the others may find it somewhat confusing so what i have done is that i have kept it very simple and essentially non technical so you won't find equations in there you won't find the models in there but i'm going to give you a story on where the problem stems from how we addressed it and what was the solution and i kept in mind the fact that if there are some people from pakistan who are looking at it they would be able to find a procedure that at least we follow in this country so with that i'm going to give you the background of where this particular issue comes from now the world economy is somewhere when i pulled this data together was about 70 to 75 trillion dollars and the corrosion damage caused in various fields throughout the world is about 3% of that gdp of the world which came out to be 2.2 trillion dollars in 2010 currently the the 
GDP has gone to about 80 to 85 or 80 to 90 trillion dollars. So you could imagine that that loss has gone up to about two and a half to three trillion dollars. And some of it is related to what you and I do, mostly engineering. And I am basically concerned with this part where the hazardous material are stored, the waterways and ports, gas and liquid pipelines, and the highway bridges. That is about 16% of $2.2 trillion. So you are talking about close to $400 billion. That's where the damage is going down the drain. I also put together the data from the US bridges. No other country keeps a record like this. My feeling is in the, in the near future, we may see something like this from China, but the Europeans are not keeping it. The Americans, when I put this together, had about 607,000 bridges. Of that, 11% were structurally deficient and 14% could not be used because they were obsolete. And if you look at the graph here, which is too busy, so I don't want you to spend too much time on it, but the District of Columbia is one of the worst, where 77% of the bridges are in trouble. Another state is Massachusetts, and then Rhode Island, and then you have Puerto Rico. These are the areas where either the weather is bad, or the corrosion is happening because of the sea winds that are coming. The problem was presented to us in this form in the early 1990s by the Ministry of Transportation. They asked us, what can we do with a bridge like this, which is after about 30, 40 years of service, is going through this kind of corrosion. Some of the girders were doing the same and the columns were literally all gone. So we came up with some solution based on our thinking that I'm going to give you. The traditional way of doing this work was that you provide the temporary support to the bridge. You remove all the material that has been damaged or corroded. You rebuild the columns or any members. And that entire cost, I'm going to give a number to it. Let's say for a certain project is a million dollars. And if we had to do that for every bridge that is damaged, the ministry didn't have the money and had no, had no hope of getting that money. So the non-traditional uh, uh, procedure that we were looking at was that we should not worry about removing the damaged and the contaminated materials. Because the contaminated material comes from the chloride that we pour on the highways and the products of steel corrosion. Now you remove those loose concrete and leave the bad material in and rebuild the member to a, their original shape and then use the external glass or carbon FRP to provide the lateral reinforcement and additionally to watertight and seal the structure. And I'll tell you what the result of that comes out. So we ended up building half scale models of, so of the two columns that were healthy, we kept that and then Two of the columns that were damaged, we didn't repair them, and we repaired the other six. And this is how the columns would look like after they have been damaged. The middle one is the one which is damaged, then various ways of retrofitting them. And the results of five of the columns that we did, the one on the right is the healthy column, which did not damage. The next to that is the damaged column. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that you don't see any steel in the lateral direction in the damaged zone. And I'll give you some explanation of that later. Then various ways of retrofitting them. 
Emaco repaired, K repaired, expensive cement repaired. Expensive cement is the one which I developed during my work and we had a patent on it. And we use that also in the actual uh, practice. So here is that column which was damaged, not repaired. And you see that from one end to the other, the steel is missing. Although the steel was spaced at about 100 millimeters, 75 to 100 millimeters spacing. This is what happened to that steel. It was flowing over the lab. And I want to draw your attention to some areas where the thinning has taken place in the spiral at various locations. That's where it breaks. Now the general idea would be by that time, this is what the general thinking was that if we lose 10%, 15% of the steel, then we can still trust the rest of the steel. And our test showed that if you have lost 10 to 15%, you perhaps don't have any steel left simply because in a continuous reinforcement, the strength of that continuous reinforcement is dominated by the weakest link. And there are too many weakest links there. So therefore we don't have much of steel left for practical purposes. So this is one of the technical piece of work that I'm going to put. The undamaged healthy column is shown in the middle. That is what is expected by the code. The damaged column is shown in red. So you notice that we have lost the strength and more importantly, we have lost the ductility and energy dissipation capacity of that structure. When we repaired the column, we gained the strength and we increased the capacity in terms of energy dissipation and ductility. So that was the encouraging part. And we, we tested these columns, we, we followed through with it and we were quite convinced. And we went back to the ministry and said, we can start working on it at least as a test case on that bridge. So here is it that we are putting some of the, we didn't remove any of the material. In one case, we had to put the, uh, the form work and then pour the expensive cement grout in. In the other cases, we could use the thixotropic materials and build the column without the form work. And that could be done basically within about half a day of several columns. And there we have the column. And now we are basically putting the FRP wrap around this. There are many steps there that I'm missing simply because we don't have the time to go over everything. And I'm going to give you several projects that we have worked on. So the FRP uh, was, 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 uh, basically wrapped around it and two layers of them. And this is how the column looked pre-upgrade. In 1996, we repaired it. And about 25 years later, the column looks exactly the same. Now you might want to ask me a question, how does column look like made of concrete on the outside? It is because after you put the FRP, there are enough coatings available that you can put that on and it would look like concrete. So what has happened here is that the inner column core, which was contaminated, corroded, terrible shape, we built around it a little annular ring, which is made of either expensive cement or non-shrink grout. Active cement will give you active confinement or expensive cement, and the non-shrink grout will give you passive confinement when the load is applied. FRP will give you, number one, the replacement of the lateral steel or spiral in this case. Number two, the confinement, which is not going to corrode over a period of time. Now we studied this column. In fact, the ministry studied this column for us so that the data is un, 
biased. For one year, they looked at the expansion of the uh, expansion of the new material, expensive material or the non shrink route, and they found out that the expensive column showed an expansion of about 1500 to 1200 micro strain, which is about 75% of the yield strain of steel. And the other cements behaved exactly the way we wanted them to behave not much of expansion, not much of shrinkage. But this is the real telling of the story. We had added half cells inside the columns, at top, middle, and bottom. We wanted to see what is happening with the corrosion. So the ministry, which was very uh, pessimistic in the beginning, and they were basically calling us uh, uh, various names, suddenly realized that a set of columns that had very high risk of corrosion, over a period of time started showing low risk of corrosion. And at the age of nine years after repair, the corrosion risk was low. Now, after this, they have never asked me a question about the validity of this procedure. And now they're telling us that this really was a milestone in their repair method, simply because after 25 years, they didn't need any, any interruption or any interference. Whereas any other normal traditional retrofit techniques had to be redone after every eight years on the average. So they found this to be quite nice. The second issue was, when I showed you the traditional method and this method, if a million dollar was needed for the traditional method, we only needed between $100,000 and $200,000, which means there was a saving of at least 80% in following this procedure. But the trick of the trade is, if you did not do the work properly and let it to be loose, which means you allowed the air and oxygen and the moisture, then this procedure won't work. And I had to sort of convince them that they should treat this, this structure now as an expensive piece of meat because they are willing to pay $50 to $100 a pound for, a, for steaks. The way they seal it, it can last for a very long time. So these structures had to be treated like this. Seal them in such a manner that you don't have to do anything with them because you have starved the corrosion process of oxygen and moisture. So that's where really the science comes in. Now I'm going to try to play this video because after this whole thing became public, we had a lot of people who wanted to listen to us. Yeah. Hello and welcome back to this special edition of Daily Planet, looking at concrete bridge engineering in light of the Laval Bridge collapse in Quebec that killed five people. We've already seen how bridges can be scanned for damage, but what can be done to fix that damage? Well, it turns out some innovative techniques can save some of these bridges, but in other cases, it's a matter of rebuilding the bridge from the ground up. And that could mean starting from scratch. We have built a lot of bridges in the 60s and the 70s. And the concrete bridges in that age group need a lot of care. But repairing concrete before a catastrophe strikes takes a little planning. This is what we find the remains of the cylinder, which was not wrapped under the impact of that load of 550 pounds. We see there is nothing left except small pieces of concrete and they're scattered all around. Dr. Shamim Sheikh thinks he can make concrete at risk even better. Concrete is a very brittle material. It is strong in compression, but even under com compression, it is very brittle. So that is why we need to make sure that we reinforce the concrete in such a manner that it becomes ductile and it absorbs the energy. This wafer-thin wrap will give concrete all the protection it needs to survive enormous stress. It's a carbon or glass-based 
fiber reinforced polymer or FRP. It's simply cut to size and glued to the outside of the concrete pier. So this is a cylinder which is wrapped with carbon FRP. The cylinder weighs about 30 pounds and we are going to place that now in the machine and test it under the impact load. The weight is raised to exactly the same two meter height. The rope is cut and... So you see here that the cylinder is completely undamaged and in fact it bounced back and the cylinder is not even in the machine. So what we notice here is that we have improved the energy absorption capacity of the concrete by several fold, perhaps about 200 times. I hope everybody heard what was going on. Yes. Yes. No, no. Okay, so this is something that was done after the repair of that Levely Street bridge on Highway 401. And then we started getting the inquiries about where we can use this material further. The test that I have shown you in this video by no means is a scientific test. We had to devise that test for the channel because they didn't like what I was doing in the lab. They felt I was going to put to sleep all their audience and viewers because our work is very tedious and very slow. So they wanted something bombastic and they liked that bombastic thing. But what came out of this was that we could really use this material for blast, for seismic and for impact. So when that impact came around, then the CN Tower issue became a very big problem. Because in the top part of this uh, CN Tower, for those of you who don't quite know the background of this structure, it is about 553 meter high structure. The dining area is here, which is at about 350 to 400 meter height. The top part is basically antenna. So there is no steel in it. Now at every level you see that there is a change in the cross section. When that change of cross section takes place, then it provides you some reasonably horizontal or inclined surface. And during the winter, you see a lot of ice gathered here. And then large pieces of ice come down and they end up damaging these units. Now, you can't stop the ice from making in, in, in an instant unless you do a lot of different, follow a lot of different techniques. And the size of those uh, blocks could be anywhere from about two meter by one meter size down to smaller pieces. But the larger pieces were damaging the structure at this level, at the other level. So you can see the location of retrofit here. And I have shown that in these two, thanks to one of my students who sent this to me last night at about 11. So this is one area where the section looks like this. And these pieces are the blocks which have three windows on the top. And at this location, this location, we have the larger blocks with two windows. So we had to make one of those and it looks like this in the cross section. We had to make one with two uh, openings, the other with three openings, retrofit that with carbon and test it under impact of the similar size ice blocks. And we had no other way of doing it in our lab, except that we went to the CN Tower and asked them to use a crane to do it. So from a height, which was approximately the same as the height in the top of the CN Tower, we ended up dropping the ice blocks several times on the same block. Looked at the damage, we did some analytical work on the site, but this is not what I wanted to show here. 
and after we were reasonably convinced as to what can be done, we went up there. Well, I didn't go there, but the company we went there had to hire, a, an, a, hire an helicopter and put it up there. And it shows some of the uh, photographs that they have taken. The surface had to be prepared and then epoxy, and then you put in all your FRP. And then we also added sensors there and the data was collected to see what kind of uh, impact is coming out. Now, as a result of that, we usually had to close the front street between Spadina and University Avenue because that was not safe for people to drive. Later on, a solution was found so that the ice, ice block sizes are reduced. Now, after all this, we needed to figure out what are we going to do with our work for further uh, use. And I want to show you a little bit of a background of the earthquake damage. Here are 10 buildings of Margala Tower in Islamabad, which you mostly perhaps know about. And during the 2005 earthquake, three of these buildings damaged or collapsed. This is how the collapsed building looked like. Now I'm going to quickly show you some of the damage, number of people got killed there. And then I also went to, thanks to a lot of people in Pakistan, and one of those persons, uh, my brother is also in the audience, Dr. Akram Sheikh. Uh, I went to Balakot uh, with the help of the army people. And you see some of these buildings standing there. And then there is a building nearby which has completely disappeared. There is another building, a hotel. And you can see how far the columns have gone. Why is it that this particular column didn't come down? And you will notice that this reinforcement is what is holding it back. Now, this is perhaps, well, perhaps the saddest moment that I went through in that area. This is a mass grave of children in a school and there are a total of 41 dead bodies there. Then you flew over to Muzaffarabad, and this is one of the hospitals that I visited. And look at the damage of the hospital. And the hospitals are something that we had to, under any circumstances, design in such a manner that they don't damage. Because they are the lifeline. And think about here the movement of the column. If this column is about 18 inch, 20 inches, so you can see that the movement of this building due to earthquake is more than a meter, somewhere in the range of 40 inches perhaps. And in this steel, you don't see much of a lateral reinforcement. So there was no hope in hell for this structure to survive. And here is one story disappearing. Usually the forces are the highest in the, in the lowest story. Here, all these cars are under the story. A few other slides from Muzaffarabad area. The building's going down and the next one is standing because it simply had some uh, resistance against the earthquake built in, perhaps unknowingly. And then properly designed structures, Supreme Court building, with almost no damage. Now, what is it that goes on in uh, uh, during an earthquake in a, in a structure? So I'm showing here a column between two floors. The axial load comes from the gravity load that we apply as human beings as the dead load. Earthquake applies the lateral load and we end up creating a zone here which is subjected to very high moment and axial force. So this little part is what we built and I tested those in the machine that I had specially built for testing these columns. 
So the column is tested horizontally, axial load is applied, and then the lateral load is applied, and the cyclic loading is applied to simulate the earthquake. And you see that damage, and then you see some of the columns retrofitted with FRP that suddenly improve. Now, this is where I'm going to spend about a minute and, and draw your attention to this. The top left is a column which was designed properly for non-seismic region. So 150 millimeter spacing was used and the axial load is very low. Generally, it would be more in buildings, less in uh, bridges. And the one on the right, is what the code would like you to have. Basically what it says is that the cycles of moment or load should be able to be resisted by the column. So we would like to have the one on the right, but we have the one on the left. I ended up making the columns which were worse than this. Number three at 150, I used it number three at 300. So even half the reinforcement of the column on the top left. And then I added one layer of carbon FRP. In this case, on the right, two layers of glass FRP. Suddenly you find a column which could be totally unfit for seismic area, becomes extremely resistant to earthquake, better than what the code would have liked you to design originally. What would be the cost of doing this? In our case, the material cost for doing this, for this 10 uh, CFRP column was about $100 or less. The one on the right was about $60, $70 or less. And if you want to apply this in those areas where the cost is low, the, perhaps the cost would be half of that. So based on this kind of work, a lot of additional retrofit was done for seismic earthquake. So we ended up doing similar columns in the lab, about 101 of them. And to that, we added the analytical work, developed the model. And then we did the parametric study, which involved about 13,800 cases. And based on that, we proposed this particular procedure, simple equation, for designing the retrofit. And this procedure has been adopted by two codes in this country. One is um, the building design, the other is for bridge design. Now, a lot of people are taking this information in their own way and adding it to their research work and, and codes because each one of the, each country has to adopt these things according to their own requirement, according to their own earthquake safety measures. So now this kind of work ended up getting attention from people like the owners of these structures, very heavy cement manufacturing plants. This one is from El Salvador. The problem here is that the height of the structure is only 80 meters, but the number of stories is only seven. So therefore, the story height is about 11, 12 meters. And this will give you a, a sort of some idea about the size of the story when you look at the people here who are about close to two meter tall and look at the story height. And the problem in this building was that some of these beams were critical in shear, which means that they would fail during an earthquake in a very brittle manner. So we had to build a small scale model of that in the lab. This is the one in the phase one, a structure which is not retrofitted. You apply the lateral load, and we also have the vertical load on this. And the one on the right is, a structure in which the beams have already failed in shear. You see the inclined cracks and they are going. We took these beams, retrofitted them with FRP, and you can see the one on the right is deflecting so much compared to the previous one. 
The previous one is looking almost straight. And the one here is deflecting quite a bit. So it can resist the earthquake. And this will show you the, the red color is showing the response of the structure without retrofit. The other one shows after the retrofit. We had to stop it here at about 160 millimeter because our capacity of the actuator ended there. You couldn't go any further. It was 150 millimeter capacity and we went to 160. But you can notice that we were able to increase the deformation capacity from about 40 to 50 millimeter to about 160. So therefore the structure is able to now go through the earthquake without much damage. So we went up there and then we did the similar work for El Salvador. And here are a few slides of repair in these areas. I'm just showing you that these are the structures that have been retrofitted with these techniques. This was an interesting technique that since the size is very large of members, we had to anchor the FRP in the middle also. So we went through the holes in the beams and the columns. And while they were draining the holes, we had to be on the alert in case they cut some of the reinforcement. And then if they did, we had to immediately propose a solution. And here are the holes. Place the rods in them and retrofit these things properly. So you see a lot of FRP having been used. Now the application in areas where you generally would not see the need for doing these things. Here is a restaurant, a very, very posh restaurant in California near Los Angeles, and it has gone literally haywire below the uh, uh, main area. And you see the reinforcement uh, totally corroded. We were able to retrofit the entire thing with FRP at a fraction of a cost that they would have otherwise uh, born with this. But now we have to figure out what are we going to do with the structures that are damaging, the one on the right here. And for that, what we are proposing is that you should be using the glass or carbon bars as the regular reinforcement instead of steel. I've only added a few slides here to give you an idea that that work has progressed quite nicely. And the one on the right is the beam with stirrups. The one on the left is the beam with the headed bars. So we tested the beams which were 650 millimeter deep. So these are full size girders. And I just want to again show you one graph here. The one on the left is the steel reinforced beam. The one on the extreme right here is the GFRT reinforced. And the one in the middle is hybrid. So we have replaced some of the GFRT with some of the steel with GFRP, but not all. And we can make that judgment based on how much stiffness is needed. You will notice one thing, that the strength of GFRP reinforced beams is higher, but the stiffness is somewhat lower. At the lower end, up to about 150 newtons, the stiffness is very similar because it is dominated by concrete. Beyond that, reinforcement dominates, and by that time, cracking has taken place. So under service load, there will be no issue with the deflection. Above service load, the cracking would be somewhat larger. So now the codes are looking into it and saying, since GFRP will not corrode, so therefore we are going to allow larger crack widths. Being the chairman of a committee which deals with the highway bridge code, we are already allowing larger crack widths. So therefore, these structures are now able to be built quite easily. So in the columns, we started with using all GFRP, vertical and spiral. 
And here are the columns. These are 356 millimeters. This is 500 millimeter because the ministry again came back to us and said, well, we can't use your small size column testing. Can you do a larger one? So we had to make half a scale model of their bridge column. It is 500 millimeter in diameter. Generally, they would use a meter or a little bit larger column in the, in the bridges. And we tested those. And here is the uh, comparison that we sent them last year. And now they are putting it in their ministry codes, allowing the spiral of made of GFRP to be used. And what we find here is that the larger column seems to be slightly better than small columns if we use the GFRP spiral in them. Now, I want to make a point here that when the corrosion starts taking place, it starts from the spiral or the lateral steel. And by the time it reaches the longitudinal steel, the structure is really not usable. So you have to now protect the spiral or the ties. And this is what we are now suggesting, that you can start using your regular steel as a longitudinal reinforcement but you need to start using the outer layer of reinforcement made of the material which would not corrode. And glass FRP is right now an appropriate replacement with respect to cost and behavior. And if you have a lot more money to spend, you can bring in carbon, which is about three times more expensive than the glasses. Now here is the use of GFRP bars in Ontario. The deck is made of all GFRP reinforcement and then you can pour the concrete in it. Here are the beams that are being made of GFRP bars. A couple of other pictures of the reinforcement in the field. <clears throat> now, I didn't sort of mention that, that when we were going from black steel to other steels, in order to reduce the corrosion in the structures. For a little while, we used epoxy coated steel. And then it occurred to us that the epoxy ends up getting cut at various locations. And that's where the corrosion starts. And then the corrosion is taking place, but we don't come to know about it because it is hidden. And suddenly the structure comes down. So the epoxy coated steel has been now banned in Ontario and many other provinces. Slowly, Americans are also stopping the use of epoxy coated bars since the GFRP bars have become quite easily available. One of the companies from New Zealand with which I worked for a long time has set up a very large manufacturing plant in North Carolina. And now they are supplying uh, the GFRP bars in the country. So the concluding remarks, the deficient structures can be upgraded if we use the FRP judiciously. If you don't use it, use it properly, it can be the worst thing you can do to a structure. And you can make these structures resistant to earthquake, blast, and other impact loads very easily and conveniently with very little cost. The procedure that we have proposed have become acceptable and they are in the codes and they are easy to use. Concrete members internally reinforced with FRP give you the behavior that are very comparable to traditionally reinforced structures with steel bars. So for those people who think that the traditional ways of doing things are better, they will realize that this is, this is no worse. So I would like to now acknowledge the people who have been supporting me over the years, the Government of Canada through their research council, ISIS Canada. This my name is very bad, but it was quite good before the ISIS came in the world. Uh, we have a number of companies in this country, in Europe, in New Zealand, uh, America, who have been supporting our work, and then a huge number of graduate students. 
I have only put those names whose work I used in this particular uh, presentation. Uh, there are three students of Pakistani origin, two Chinese, and a couple of people from here. So we have a multitude of brains put together, and when they work together, they do a lot better. And all this work was done in the University of Toronto. So, Jahandeep Saab, I'm done, and I'm sorry it's a little longer than initially we thought, but I think the technical problems were partly responsible. Yeah, thank you very, thank you very much, Samin Sir. Bahut, bahut so now I will unmute. So if anybody has questions to Dr. Saab. Yeah, Dr. Yes, Saab. I, I have a question. Uh, I raise my hand first. Okay. So go you ahead. go by the hands. <laughs> my name is Kareen Ahmed. If you could allow me to ask a few questions, uh, I appreciate it. Yes. So first of all, uh, Professor Sheikh, I'm very, very thankful to you. Uh, you spare some time, uh, uh, of course, from your very busy schedule. And I have uh, come to know about your credentials, your achievements, your publications. And in fact, I'm very, very impressed. It's highly commendable. I come from uh, Energy Engineering University. And uh, of course, I'm a member of NEDEC. And of course, UETAC is our sister alumni association and very dear to us. And I'm, I'm very, very thankful to, to you, Tech, you know, for inviting us in this uh, worthwhile presentation of yours, uh, Dr. Shamim Sheikh. My question, uh, there are a few questions uh, I'd like to ask. Uh, of course, I'll be very, very careful because I'm not practicing structural engineering. Actually, I'm practicing geotechnical engineering. Uh, you mentioned about the ministry and the ministry, the actually Ministry of Transportation where I work. And I design, uh, you know, like a complex foundations, uh, the, some of the bridges and some of the bridges, actually the picture you showed, it appears to be my project in the Northern region. So my question uh, to you is, of course, uh, uh, I'll be very, very careful. This uh, fiber reinforcement polymer is, uh, uh, is extremely impressive. And, uh, you know, the biggest problem we face, not only the superstructure, but also in the foundation, which is the subsurface and structure, is the corrosion. And our bridges, when we design our bridges, uh, basically they are designed for 75 years. And sometime again, you mentioned about Highway 401 in your, one of your, uh, I think there was your ad or something, Highway 401 and Leslie Bridge, and that's also one of my bridge, where we used uh, existing foundation because some of time existing foundation, although we designed it for 75 years, we think that we can save lots of money if we utilize existing foundation. But the problem is that again, in the existing foundation, there's a concern of you know corrosion uh, if uh, they, are, they are driven pies and everything. And for that, we really load lots of tests, pile load tests. At the same time, all we check you know how much sectional uh, uh, loss has been taken place, and we go from there. Uh, the thing is definitely fiber reinforcement. Again, there the glass fiber and carbon fiber, and carbon fiber being you know the better than glass fiber. But again, I mean, this is 30 times more expensive than the other type of reinforcement. Uh, I can see this is lighter, uh, the compressive string, the bond strength, and everything is fantastic and fantastic. But when I read some of the papers, ductility is one of the problem. And ductility, uh, what they're saying that in the harsh climate where you're expecting earthquake or maybe tornado or something like that, that could be a concern because it's a ductility, it has a low ductility, and uh, the creep is a concern. If you keep it bending for a long time, perhaps it can break or something. So it, it still, I mean, you can use that. Uh, but the thing is that, that it has to be that you have to keep like a higher factor of safety and you have to over design. And of course that boils down to cost. So that is something, of course, you are the expert. And of course you talked about the retrofitted and everything. I mean, retrofitted is something different, but if you are just replacing your steel rebar with, you know, this fiber uh, rebars, uh, glass fiber or carbon fiber or something like that, then in that case, you must think what will happen in this, in the harsh climate, if there is tornado or earthquake, whether the structure will sustain. That's one thing. But my question is other. My question is again related to, to my area, which is the deep foundations, where in the deep foundations we have driven piles, but the corrosion is a concern. And sometimes in caisson, again in the caisson, we use rebar uh, cages. And the rebar cages are again, I mean, they are, you know, like a back steel. Whether in future we can use 
fiberglass reinforcement in our caissons or when we use driven piles, we use normally HP piles if this is the H section or something like that. It's very, very like a low displacement pile, we can call it. Uh, of course, they are much larger in size than the normal reinforcement we use in the super structure. But who knows in future, they will come up with that size. Uh, of, uh, and perhaps, uh, so are, do you think that we are thinking that in future, perhaps we will have driven piles made of fiber reinforcement polymer? And also the other question was asked that whether this fiber reinforcement polymer has been tested in fire condition. Like for example, if the building is on fire or something like that, how this will behave and perform as compared. So these are the question, uh, Dr. Shavim Sheikh, and thank you so, so much. It was very, very you know, informative uh, presentation. I really appreciate that. First of all, uh, thank you for asking the questions. I want to congratulate you for having graduated from NED. I had several students of NED, and I want to mention here uh, about one of them who is really my pride. He is currently the president of an Australian company uh, of North American, well, North American subsidy of uh, an Australian company, uh, Lycopodium Minerals. He's a graduate of, he's a graduate of uh, NED, and he did his master's with me, absolutely a bright individual. So NED has produced some very, very great engineers. Now you have raised the issues that are really um, the current ongoing work. You have talked about the cost. Uh, I spent at least a couple of years discussing with the ministry about the cost. I think the reason we think steel reinforced structures are cheaper is because we look at the cost of construction in the next year. But if you look at the life cycle cost, steel structures are perhaps the most expensive structures you can build. That is why I started my presentation by telling you what is the cost of corrosion. Secondly, you talked about the piles and you talked about the deep foundations. I have spent 10 years in Houston as a professor with the University of Houston. I used to visit an area called Galveston there on the Gulf of Mexico. It's about only 40 miles from there. And if you go to Galveston, you will find that the water is primarily brown, simply because all the structures that are built there, they are made of steel and they have been corroding and that whole area is in trouble. <clears throat> I have started a project two years ago in which what we are suggesting is that we will build columns made with GFRP bars. And we are going to be subjecting them to marine environment at 60 degree centigrade. That work will have to give us some results before we can start putting out some recommendations. My gut feeling is that if you can make the reinforced concrete piles with either carbon uh, bars and pre-stress them or with high strength glass bars and pre-stress them, you perhaps can use them to drill into the, um, into the uh, water areas. Secondly, another area that I am working with a company in Germany to look into, that FRP people have started making hollow structural shapes. So you can think about a square uh, FRP section, which is hollow inside. If you can drill that into the sea and, and pour concrete with it and make sure that in that FRP tube, you have the vertical reinforcement and you have the horizontal reinforcement. 
And then within that concrete, you can perhaps use FRP bars or other bars. I would, I would even go to the extent if you use steel bars in that area and not let it be exposed to water and air, they perhaps would last a long time. So one needs to understand the science of corrosion and find the solution accordingly, making sure that we get the strength and the stiffness and the ductility. You have raised a very interesting issue of ductility that we discussed in the 1990s for a very long time. When I first suggested that I'm going to take this column and wrap it with, uh, uh, with FRP, one of my colleagues, who is the most respected structural engineer in the world, in one of the most respected in the world, came to me and told me that I was wrong, that the FRP just breaks without notice. And he and I had a lot of discussion saying, we need to look at the strain at which it breaks. The steel would yield at 0.2% strain, whereas FRP, GFRP would break at 1% to 2% strain. You're talking about already 10 times, 5 to 10 times. So by that time, the structure would become unusable in any case. So we are worrying about things that perhaps are not as important. So when I first tested the column, I had him in the lab. And after looking at the displacement and the load and the moment in the column, he was quite surprised. And he did a lot of work then at the data and was convinced that the way we were using it would work quite nicely. For internal reinforcement, I don't think we have resolved all the issues. That is why the committee that I'm chairing right now, we have about 20 members and we fight it out like dogs when we have to look at a sentence to be added to the code because we have a lot of fear in our mind that will this be used, abused, misused, so that we want to make sure that the structures are not safe. So rest assured that if anything comes out of the course, if any research comes out, a lot of thoughts have been given to the pros and the cons, and one must use these materials with caution, knowing what you are doing. And it's the same with steel. No, no material can be used blindly. So you and I can perhaps continue discussing things uh, forever. Uh, and please, please feel free to send me an email if the need be. Uh, I don't know who to pick next, but I... So next is Kareem Tahir Shah. So Kareem Shah, would you can go ahead. Assalamualaikum. Yeah, it's not a question. It's only a feeling of gratitude that I wish to offer to Professor Saheb. He was very kind. I'm the property manager of Ahmadiyya Board of Peace, located in northwest end of Toronto. We had similar problems with our beams. That they were near to collapse, and he came up to help us. It was researched, and fiberglass reinforcement was done. It's a sample example. In, within Toronto for use of these materials, and it has been very successful. We have nothing but prayers for Professor Saab. Kareem Saab, I, I have to respond to your comment. You have always, always been very kind. Um, theirs was a building uh, which started showing the damage the year after it was constructed, and we had no clue where the damage was coming from. In any case, after a couple of years of uh, investigation, we figured out what was going on. And uh, considering that uh, study case, I asked the answer to give us some money and they did. And we ended up building the full scale beams. And uh, we tested those beams when we felt that they worked, we suggested the solution. And I asked Kareem Saab if he would like one of these beams put at, at his site as an example. So he took one of those beams. We send the rest of the beams to the dump, but there may be that beam sitting there in the backyard of their building. 
that was a long time ago. Yes, unfortunately, about 10 years ago, it was taken off with you know, off site. But I wish we could have left it there <laughs> along with the historic uh, plate. But unfortunately, this was removed. But okay. anyway, the uh, repair which was done is still there. And uh, we need some work to be done with your help again uh, for uh, covering it. Uh, it, it is now in partially exposed. But that is a separate subject. I'll talk to you uh, individual uh, in person for this and get further help. I want to I want to give you one piece of information. The company which made your which made the repair, it got sold five years ago for hundred and twenty million dollars. I wish to hell that I had bought that part of that company, but this is not where we go. Anyway. Um, let me ask Nazli to ask her question because I want to give the preference to our women audience. Oh, thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, it was really very informative uh, session. And uh, I just have uh, uh, one question. Actually, I just started learning this material and, and I just recently used it in one of the deficit uh, structure. Uh, can we use this for uh, retrofitting of parking structures and just the regular building structures? Because sometimes we uh, found that the slab is not designed properly or the column was under design. Uh, like just recently, we had a problem that uh, we designed the column for 80 MPA, but the concrete after testing came out to be 35 MPA. So now the uh, we need to retrofit those type of columns. So can we use this material for that? Absolutely. Uh, this is the material that can be used to provide the tensile forces mm -hmm. wherever the tensile forces are lacking. So in the process, you want to make sure that the bond to the concrete is proper. Mm -hmm. And you want to make sure that the direction of the force will be in the correct direction. Sure. Two of the two of the applications that I didn't include here would be in line with what you are trying to do. Union Station, mm -hmm. uh, hundred some old, old, I think it's about now hundred five years old structure. Mm -hmm. When they wanted to retrofit it for whatever it is today, the NOR consulting group came to us and said, there are columns there, which are one meter in diameter with zero reinforcement, unreinforced. Yes. <laughs> what do you want us to do with it? Because we don't want to remove them. Right. So that is when we did a very detailed analysis and gave them a design in which we use the longitudinal reinforcement of carbon fibers stuck to the surface. Okay. And they work in compression with concrete. Although, okay. the, fiber, although the fiber you would realize don't work. But then you have to wrap it also. So we ended up providing the longitudinal fibers and the lateral mm -hmm. fibers. So these okay. columns are now these columns are now taking the load of the additional structure built on top of it, including the train load. Okay. Very so good. so this structure is working fine, and they did their analysis. We did ours. We checked through, and we checked their work. They checked our work. The second was that the Museum of Civilization was being built in Manitoba. Mm -hmm. Winnipeg. And I got a frantic call that we missed the reinforcement in a wall. We know that it is less than needed, and now we are in big trouble. So, for that, we proposed the solution with carbon. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had estimated about one and a half million dollars uh, loss if they wanted to do it through traditional means. Mm -hmm. And after they finished the work, they told me that it was $110,000 that they had to spend with the, with the carbon fibers. When I sent them my bill, 
they felt it was an insult to the work. So they ended up increasing my bill by about 80%. Wow. <laughs> their own. They felt they felt these engineers don't know what their bloody worth. So, so you should keep in mind that you are giving solutions to the world that is keeping them afloat. Right. Uh, one more question about the fire rating, because we are if we are retrofitting the slabs of a building structure, we have to keep in mind the two hour minimum, two hour fire rating. And um, I found very less material in uh, our building code than ACI code. ACI has a certain uh, uh, detailed uh, description of what uh, uh, load combination or what, what load factors we can use for um, uh, service load design. But uh, when I was looking at NBCC for uh, reference, I couldn't find anything. So I just use ACI code factor to check my slabs. Yeah, I would I would suggest a couple of things there. Uh, no code yet has mm -hmm. been able to say it definitively anything about the fire rating. Oh, okay. Uh, and I think the first question was related to that, and I missed it. Um, there is a lot of data from research. Mm -hmm. It has not yet found its way into the codes because of the oh. because of some disagreements. You would not realize that sitting in a code committee, people mm -hmm. fight worse than the traditional story of mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. <laughs> I know. It almost looks like that <laughs> in each other, and when they get out, they are friends again. So. There is a very huge discussion right now on fire rating. Okay. I was one of those who was against using FRP in situations where the fire is a problem. Uh -huh. Slowly, the new work is convincing me that we can handle it. Uh -huh. um, the company which did the uh, work at uh, uh, Green Tahar's building Mm -hmm. and which did the work for us in CN Tower, they have developed for the external FRP, mm -hmm. fire coating. Oh, okay. And that fire coating has been tested for more than two hours of fire rating. Okay. In the USA and in Canada, NRC labs. Mm -hmm. So when you are designing it, you must ask the company mm -hmm. provide us with the fire rating reports. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you need their contact, I, I can give you one uh, off the screen because I don't want to name their names here. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so, I will definitely contact you for that. So, so these are the people who have been working with me since about 1985, 89, 90. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, they, are, they have developed very nicely this material. Mm -hmm. another, another set of tests that I completed in Korea, we made uh, very large columns, mm -hmm. applied the load to it. They were reinforced with uh, either steel or FR GFRP. We put them in the fire uh, furnace. Under load, they were put in fire. If the steel column failed in 45 minutes, the GFRP reinforced column failed in 38 minutes. Oh, okay. We are right now scratching our heads to figure out what is going on there. Mm -hmm. Although we did the test before the pandemic, I still haven't been able to figure out how do I explain. That is why I have two of my students, both are Pakistani students. They are looking into high temperature behavior of the FRP. FRP. Mm -hmm. One is looking into the bars, the other is looking external. I think mm -hmm. they both may be here, Fedan, Qureshi, and Jahan Zaid. Absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic work is going to come out. It is already published in ACI partly, but the rest mm -hmm. of the papers are going to come very soon. Mm -hmm. So we find that with a bit of a thinking, we can handle this problem without any problem.
so soon that will be part of NBCC also or no, no chance? <laughs> No, no, you never know when it will happen. But keep in mind that the codes are only changed after five or six years. Five, yes. But if we find that there is a need for doing it right away, we may give addendum. Yes. Okay, because sometimes if it's not in the code, and even if you prove with the research, uh, uh, our city department don't accept it. Exactly. And they need to be educated because the code specifically says Yes. If you can prove it by research analysis, yes. you can use it. Yes. We are in debate with one of the city officials on this, but yeah, they are sometimes very reluctant. They would be, it would be a long debate. I can assure you that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tom Nitipan, and I am from uh, uh, NIDAC as well. Um, you, I, I, your presentation was very interesting to me because I am actually working in a steel reinforcing bar company. <laughs> yeah. So I haven't heard about the stainless steel. You mentioned epoxy coated, you mentioned the uh, regular rebar, uh, and also FRP, uh, but you haven't mentioned, you haven't compared <laughs> anything about the stainless steel versus FRP. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I had a picture there in which I showed the stainless steel, but I realized that because we lost a bit of time, I didn't mention that. I have looked into stainless steel. I haven't done the testing with it, but I have looked into it. And what I see is that there are about four different varieties of stainless steel. Two of them are excellent. One of them is very bad. The cost is what is determining the quality. And unfortunately, one from China is growth very quickly. But if the stainless steel can be made not to corrode, that would be the best solution. Mm -hmm. I would give up my FRP bars for stainless steel if you can give that to me at a reasonable price. But the stainless steel is right now, cost is very high, and people are still not willing to pay for it. In terms of the ductility, I think it is quite reasonable. Um, it, it is less than black steel, but it is re reasonable. Uh, secondly, testing of stainless steel will need to be done very quickly just to make sure there is nothing untowards in this material that we don't know about. And then I think we can move on. Let me take the next question, please. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Saab. Uh, my name is Arshad Mahmood. I am working in the Western uh, Canada, uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, uh, Alberta, BC, and North Saskatchewan, Northwest Territories. So basically, I'm a water resource engineer. I heard your uh, presentation with full attention. This is not my field. I am also working as, as a bridge planning engineer. Uh, and we are using uh, lots of culverts in a very corrosive environment, like uh, pH value. We take pH value or resistivity. And we're using the polymer uh, coated uh, culverts there. So I will definitely like to appreciate your presentation and I'm I am honored to talk to you you know and I will ask the uh, my friends you know which are uh, uh, providing this presentation if you guys can provide me this presentation and the contact of Dr. Saab so I will share this thing with my structure engineer thank you very much Dr. Saab. Just quickly to tell you that uh, there is a culvert which is quoting the QEW going from Toronto to Niagara Falls Okay. And some of those culverts were were retrofitted with uh, CFRP, and I and I took that part out of my presentation, and we found out that again we could very quickly solve that problem if we did Let me take the last question from Shri. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Doctor, thank you very much. I listen. I have seen your presentation. Uh, basically, I'm an electrical engineer. I'm not a civil engineer. 
I'm I'm an Indian. I'm from Ladakh. So my basic question is, uh, uh, you, you, you mentioned that when we have corrosion in the pillars of the of the bridges, and you you make the reinforcement material which which is wrapped around and uh, pour the pour the uh, the concrete in it. But I would like to understand what the 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 steel inside which is already corroded and already finished. What happens to that? Is it not taking the load anymore, or what? What happens to that? What, what happens to that steel? I'm glad that you raised it. Uh, see, what we tested there was that the longitudinal steel were not damaged. It was the spiral wedge which was damaged. Okay, and so, yeah, go ahead. And in, in, in cases, the longitudinal is steel is damaged, and what happens? Well, then we have a separate problem to deal with. Okay. What we oh. did there, because we are not here to solve all the problems, but what we did there was that you look at a certain problem and find the solution for that problem. Now, that problem for the for the Leslie State Bridge would have been about 10 to $20 million for MTO. When they were able to do it within a million dollars, they were dancing for a long time. So that solution was since the longitudinal steel is doing well, let us ignore spiral steel as having do, are doing nothing. Now make sure that that corroded steel is covered in such a manner that it doesn't start the corrosion anywhere else. So therefore, remove the supply of oxygen and moisture. Then provide the lateral reinforcement with the help of glass. And then hope for the best and keep measuring the data. And it turned out to be that our thesis was right and it worked very well. If the longitudinal steel has corroded, then we have to figure out where has it corroded. But if it has corroded at a lot of places, you may end up reaching a stage where you say, you must remove this column or you must rebuild this column entirely. So in that case, I would like to see the ministry people fired first. Because if you allow a column to reach a stage where the longitudinal steel is being corroded, then the collapse of that bridge may become imminent. So we really don't want to go there. Okay. Thank you so, very much. Jahan, we have just Thank one you. last minute. And okay. this is something, it, it just came to my mind and that's why I want to say it. Thank you. Aap hai engineer sorry. Uh, saan 1820 ke kareeb ek sahab hote se agra mein. उनका एक शेर था ले सांस भी आहिस्ता के नाजुक है बहुत काम आफाक की इस कारगाह शीशा गरी का यानी इस दुनिया में जो हो रहा है ना इस वक्त अगर हम इंजीनियर थोड़े से समझदार ना हुए तो थिंग्स मे गेट आउट ऑफ आवर कंट्रोल और वो 1820 में ये सोच रहा था कि ये चीजें बहुत नाजुक हैं थोड़ी सी चीज इधर-उधर होती है ना तो बहुत गड़बड़ हो जाती है so I think engineers need to be alert. Thank you very much, sir, Jahan Deep Saab, and, and I'm really yeah. glad to have spoken with all these great people. Let me also introduce uh, my brother, Dr. Akram Sheikh. He is joining us from Islamabad, and I think it's already 10.30 there. No. Well, thank you very much, Meem. Thank you all. Excellent talk. Best of luck. OK. Thank Best you. Uh, thank you, Jan uh, Sahib Khan Sahib, our chair for PDC. It is an honor uh, to work with a great team of directors like you. But special thanks to Dr. Shamim Sheikh for delivering such an informative and great presentation. I believe that uh, this inf information will provide a real source of data for future researchers and engineers across the globe. I must acknowledge that you are an institution in yourself, Dr. Saab. Whenever we talk on any topic, honestly, I'm giving same from my heart that uh, 
you know, whether it's the engineering side, organization side, or towards the compassion side that you're working with the Dill Foundation. You know, a lot of people, they don't know that the, the charity work on your side. We engineers feel blessed to have such a, you know, great mentor like you. The special presence of um, uh, NADAC president, engineer Nazli Khan, uh, Islam Nabi Saab, Sharif Saab, uh, Shikak Ran Saab, and the other friends from NADAC tells me that we engineers own Dr. Shamim Sheikh at every stage uh, because of your knowledge and compassion. I want to be short. I just want to say thank you, NADAC and UT alumni who were there and special thanks to EDC and uh, FAMSA. You know, we, we all owe you a lot. You are doing a wonderful work during this pandemic time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So with that, we can conclude our session. Thanks. And thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. very much. Sir, can thank you, you very much. Uh, Salim, sir, can thank we get you. the recording of this session? Yes, I have already requested to uh, Jahangir Khan, sir. Uh, you know, sure. mm -hmm. it, will it will take about like, you know, uh, 10 to 15 days. Because of the you know lot of work in yeah world. whenever it's ready and yeah. I would like to have the con ready. contact details of uh, uh, Dr. Shamim Sheikh Saab because I have some more questions which I could, could not ask here. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.